all stand to our feet? Welcome to our second night of the 59th Hawaii Assemblies of God District Conference. How many of you are expecting something tonight? Oh, come on. Right? When you go to a buffet, you prepare. You don't eat. You come ready for something and expecting. How many of you are expecting something tonight? Praise God. Well, whether you're here or online, welcome. We're so glad to have each and every one of you here. I can already feel it. There's faith in the room. We're going to believe and expect God and worship Him tonight. So let's bow our heads and pray. Lord, we are so thankful that we get to gather together, all islands, all across our Hawaii district, Lord, to come and lift up one name, and that's your name, the name that's above all names. The name that's bigger than cancer, greater than addiction. It's your name that we worship. It's your name that we praise, Lord. It's your name that we're going to lift eye tonight, Lord. So, Lord, we come with great faith and expectation for you to have your way, we pray, Lord. We ask this in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. amen. Come on, high five your neighbor. Tell them glad you're here at God's house. It's a church of life. Forever is the name of Jesus. 
Lord, just give him praise tonight. Lord, you reign. God, you reign. You establish your kingdom here tonight, Lord, in our praises. We thank you, Jesus. Oh, isn't God so good? He reigns. I, I think that's something important for us to declare, especially in the world we're living in, the, the climate that we're in. When there's so much uncertainty and half-truths and things that don't make sense, there's one thing that never changes. God reigns. We stand on that truth. Amen. The rock that never, that never wavers and never moves. And it's that foundation that really we stand on that gives hope in this world. And so we're so thankful today. Well, before you're seated, won't you just greet a couple of people around you? Let them know you're glad to see them. All right, well, as we continue in our time of worship, I have the privilege to take a few moments in our time of giving and generosity. So let me ask you a question. Are you ready to give? Look at your neighbor, ask them, are you ready to give? Ask your second choice too. Make sure they're ready to give. You know, I was, I was just thinking... What would be really cool tonight is if we just had an all play, an all in, everybody give something tonight. Wouldn't that be cool? You might be you're like, Evan, but I only have a dollar. If you only have a dollar, you should totally just give it all. Like just, just whatever, if, if, whatever you got, if at least it was a dollar, 50 cents, if everyone decided tonight, I'm, I'm going to do something. I'm going to get some skin in the game. Every pastor, if we had our church soul and give something tonight. So there's different ways you can give. Uh, the QR code on the screen. I think they got the offering envelopes. And uh, as you're preparing your offering, again, let's just, let's just decide. Let's just do, it doesn't have to be complicated. We just say, we're, let's all do something. Wouldn't that be cool? I mean, really, to walk out thinking everybody gave something tonight. Remember, God doesn't look at amounts. It's the equal, not equal amounts, equal amounts of sacrifice. And we all get involved. And, you know, I was, um, I was thinking, let me ask you this question. Have you ever lost something? Anybody here ever lost something? Yeah, a couple of you guys um, lost something. I just lost something Sunday. You know, I like golfing. I was out golfing uh, with Pastor Dan on Sunday. And I, I had this little, and you guys probably don't even care about, a little ball marker thing, all right? And it's from a golf club with with a logo that you can't even get anymore. And so it's like classic and it was special to me. And I loved it. And I would take good care of it. And I put it in my bag all the time. My son asked to borrow I'm like, no, you're not, you can use the junk one. You're not using this one because you can't replace it. And do you know that on Sunday I put it in my pocket and when I went to reach for it, it slipped out and it was gone. And I was more sad than I let out because I didn't want Pastor Dan to think I was a wimp, but I was sad. Look at your neighbor and go, aw. Yeah, I woke up, I went to sleep that night, I woke up this morning, I was still sad about it. It was gone. I lost it as much as I loved it, it was gone. I got my rental car, my rental car, I don't know who rented it before me, but when I opened the back, there was a nice slick black case, it was overlooked, it was nice Bose headphones. I know, and I found it, and I was like, praise the Lord, you still answer prayer, God. No. I'm returning it. I hope whoever lost it gets it back. But they lost it. I'm sure it was special to them. You know, in the summer, we went on a trip last year. We were gone for two weeks. We had a big chest freezer. And we got home. And without realizing it till the next day, I don't know how long that freezer was broken. 
And I smelled something when we got home late that night, but I thought, gee, is there a dead rat in here? I'm searching in the garage, and finally I lock eyes on that refrigerator. I'm like, oh, no, because it was full. And I cracked it open, and it was the most pungent smell in my whole life that I had to go wash my nostrils. I couldn't get the smell out. I've never smelled a dead body, but I would assume that's it was sludge. It was gross. It, it was, and I, I remember telling my wife, we lost everything in there. All that food that we had that we were saving up. I was thinking, man, I wish we could have just had a big party and ate all that. We could have fed so much people. It was all gone. And I went to bed that night and that I was reminded of that scripture. Don't store up for yourself treasures on earth that can get corrupted. Think about whatever special thing you have here on earth. It could be a ball marker, it could be a guitar, it, it, could, be, it, it could be anything, whatever you have. It could be your freezer full of food. In an instant, as much as you love it and you want to protect it, it can be gone. Someone can steal it. You can forget it. Your house could burn down. I mean, in an instant, it could be gone. And you know, I went to bed thinking that and I woke up after thinking, what can I do? How, how can I live my life so that I'm not wasting things that I, that I think are so important? You know, you've heard, you ever heard anybody say that? You can't take anything to heaven. But do you know that there's one thing we can take to heaven? People. People are the only thing we can take for heaven, take with us to heaven. And any time that we take our finances and we give our finances to the cause of the kingdom of God. You know why we do that? We, we give because we want to see lives changed so that people can have an encounter with God so that we can take him to heaven. When you talk about that, what does that mean, giving money to send our treasure to heaven? You know what? Every time we give, we're giving. Lives are transformed. That treasure is going to be in heaven one day. And I hope that we can remember that. When we get into church, we have the opportunity to give. We come here in this district conference. There's pastors. Um, that There are literally thousands of people represented by the leaders in this room today. As you give tonight, you're giving and you're, you're sowing to the cause of the kingdom of God to keep building our district so we can build leaders, so that we can build influence, so we can begin to reach people so that people can come to know God and we can send treasure up to heaven. I think it's important that we recognize that we can make a difference, whether it's one dollar, five dollars, a thousand dollars, ten thousand, whatever you can do, we can give and we can make that investment that we're never going to lose, that investment that will never go to waste. Amen. So let's all decide today to do something. Let's sow, let's sow some treasure. Today you get to invest in the kingdom currency, the kingdom of God. Let's sow into this and we're going to give believing that there are going to be lives impacted through this moment right now. Amen? You guys still happy? Smile. All right. Because somebody said it, right? God likes the cheerful giver. So smile. Father, we thank you. God, and I just thank you for generosity to be released in this room. God, that we live generously, giving, sowing, giving into the kingdom, Lord, giving for lives to be changed. And so I thank you, Father, for every person here. God, that we just get our priority when it comes to our finances in order. In Jesus' name, amen.
Oh, what a great job they did. It's incredible. And, and the guys before. That was, that was awesome. 
That was awesome. Um, so today in our business meeting uh, for our denomination, the Assemblies of God, we had elections for our executive uh, officers here. And so we voted and uh, confirmed them. And so we just wanted to bring them up real quick and introduce. So first of all, our superintendent, Pastor Clayton Cole. Our assistant superintendent, Pastor James Tex Texera. Our secretary, Dr. Janelle Morocco. And we have uh, a, a new election here, and that is replacing Pastor Opeta. Uh, Pastor Daryl Kua was voted in today as our new treasurer. Wait, you guys, keep clapping. He's still walking. Keep clapping. Congratulations. Um, is it okay if we pray for you? Can we all stand? This represents here our leadership for the district of Hawaii, um, our spiritual covering. And so I want to ask, keep them in prayer whenever you remember. Keep your pastor in prayer, but keep them in prayer also, our spiritual covering. So can we just stretch our hands towards them today? Father, we thank you for uh, these four right here who stepped into these leadership roles, God. And Father, I just pray that you continue to give fresh vision, Lord, and leadership, boldness, Lord. Give them uh, different insights into different things, God, and that you will equip them for this next season, for the task that is at hand, Lord. And together, Lord, we'll continue to make Jesus famous here in the great state of Hawaii. In Jesus' name, and we all said, amen. 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 Praise God. Let's give Jesus a hand. Amen. Wasn't that awesome, the men brass and uh, the tea challenge guys, can we give them a hand? Man, I feel the presence of God. I feel like revival's in the air. And uh, let's just keep pressing into what God has in store for us, amen? There's so much more. Turn to your neighbor, tell your neighbor, there's so much more. You know, the moment we lose our hunger... Right? The moment we lose our hunger, that's when it all stops. But when we keep hungry for more of God, he keeps pouring it in. He keeps filling. And uh, let's keep hungry for more of God. And, and maybe, you know, you, you, you hunger for yourself and you're satisfied. Well, hunger for someone else. Right? Hunger for more people to get saved, more people to be delivered. And it's not just for you and your family, but for the whole island. Let's hunger for revival for Hawaii. Amen. How many of you would like to see more uh, men in Teen Challenge, right? <clears throat> so we need to have that kind of vision where we can see uh, more being delivered, more being set free, more shouting in the street and, and preaching Jesus all over. Amen? This Tonight we're so blessed to have in our pulpit uh, just a dear friend and a great leader in our movement, Dr. Ron McManus. And um, some of you pastors, you, you remember Dr. Ron as he came and he did these, um, um, you know, seminars. He, he went island hopping and did the Acts 2 journey on different islands. And, um, but for those of you that don't know Dr. Ron, uh, he was the lead pastor for 16 years uh, in a church before becoming the first president of Equip. Uh, which is John Maxwell's ministry in providing uh, leadership training for pastors internationally. And, uh, but as God had more for him, he f he's now the president and founder of Legacy Transition Group. And over the last 20 years, he has served as an interim pastor for 13 churches. In the last three years, he has helped lead 20 transitions of pastors, handing the baton off to the next leader. And... This is a very vital ministry because 
the Assemblies of God, as well as many churches, are in a transitional season where the baton is being handed off to the next generation. And it's so important, pastors, that we understand, that we, uh, that we plan for a smooth transition so that the vision that we've built will not be lost, but will continue to grow for future generations to come. And so I am so blessed to have uh, Dr. Ron McManus, and I know he'll bless your heart. So would you give him a warm aloha welcome as he comes. Dr. Ron McManus is a leader of leaders. His heart and passion is to raise up, equip, and empower the next generation of leaders. He became the first president of Equip, a ministry of John Maxwell that provided training for leaders internationally. Since then, he has served many churches and helped many pastors transition successfully. He has developed and taught the Acts 2 journey, which challenges leaders to assess their own strengths and prepare for the future. Please welcome to the stage, Dr. Ron McManus. Dr. Ron McManus. Well, it's just an honor to be here tonight. I'm just glad to be anywhere, are you? Especially grateful to be here in Hawaii with you and, and uh, Pastor uh, Ko and has just been such a, a, an incredible inspiration to me over these last several years and uh, came and worked with him a number of years ago here at First Assembly and, and I've had the joy of, uh, of taking uh, many, many churches in Hawaii through the Acts 2 journey and uh, seeing God do incredible things uh, through pastors and churches that are here. And so I'm just, I'm just honored to be here tonight. And uh, I mean, already uh, we've we've already had a, a conference. I mean, the, the message last night. What a powerful word last night! And then if, if yeah, if you missed the superintendent this morning, you know you need to go get that uh, DVD because uh, our our pastor uh, shared his heart with us today and uh, incredible things that I think are important for us in these days. Pastor mentioned uh, the Legacy Transition Group, and, uh, you know, I'm older than dirt, and I just got started with stuff, and it's just, it's crazy because uh, five months ago, the Lord gave me something else that I'm supposed to do before I'm done, and, and I can't talk about that yet tonight, but every pastor is temporary. That's revelation knowledge to somebody in the room right now, I can just, uh, yeah. <laughs> so here's the question. Is your church going to transition by design or default? 95% of them in the assemblies have got to be in by default. And what happens sometimes in the hand off the baton is everything that was built over 20 and 30 years gets lost because we haven't handed things off effectively to the next generation. And God has helped us to work with a lot of churches and, and we're seeing God do incredible things. Right now I'm at Mammoth Worship Center in Marlboro, New Jersey, a great, great church that we're looking for the next pastor for. Uh, I'm taking resumes after church tonight. No, I can't do that because I'm in Hawaii. And, and uh, I'd never get invited back if you left Hawaii and came to New Jersey. So, uh, But we're just excited about all God's doing. Uh, I wrote a book about it a year ago uh, about my journey of the last 25 years. You know, you can't make stuff up like this. I mean, you, you, you read stories of the journey in the last few years. Uh, and assemblies of God churches uh, that you would not believe. Uh, and so uh, we're just grateful that God has given us this opportunity. Our general superintendent, Doug Clay, wrote the foreword for this, and uh, he is committed uh, to working with our team. 30, there are 30 leaders right now serving uh, with Legacy Transition Group all over the country. Uh, right now, 12 churches are in transition that our team is leading right now from the West Coast uh, to the East Coast. And uh, we're just grateful for the opportunity God has given us to, to make a difference in these days. I want to talk to you about your destiny tonight. And sometimes you've got to be shaken into your destiny. Job chapter 29, verse 1. Moreover, Job continued his parable and he said, Oh, that I were as in months past as in the days when God preserved me. When his candle shined upon my head, drawn by his light, I walked through darkness. As I was in the days of my youth, when the secret of God was upon my tabernacle, when the Almighty was yet with me, when my children were all around me. And then he comes down to verse 18, and Job says, Then I said, I shall die in my nest, 
and I shall multiply my days as the sand. When you come to the book of Hebrews, which I believe Paul is the author of, in chapter 12 of Hebrews, it's very much the Lord talking to us uh, that have come through COVID. And he says these things, see to it that you do not refuse him who speaks. If they did not escape when they refused him who warned them on earth, how much less will we if we turn away from him who warns us from heaven? At that time his voice shook the earth, but now he has promised once more, I will shake not only the earth, but also the heavens. The words once more indicate the removal of what can be shaken, that is created things, so that which cannot be shaken may remain. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us be thankful and worship God acceptably with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. The nest is a needful thing. It's a good place to be born in, and it's a nice place to live, but it's a great place to leave. Webster says, a nest is a structure made or chosen by birds, turtles, hornets, fish for the spawning and raising of their young. He further defines a nest as a cozy, snug place to live in and retreat to. I'm a third generation Pentecostal in this movement, and I'm extremely grateful for my heritage in the Assemblies of God. But I believe as the Holy Spirit continues to prepare us for this new day, that God is speaking to us about a fresh movement and being shaken into our destiny. When you study the great moves of God over history, it revolved around a hunger from God and a shaking from the status quo, from business as usual, from prescribed ways of doing things. And I believe the Holy Spirit has brought us to this crucial juncture as we prepare for the last day of harvest to be shaken into a destiny far beyond anything we've ever known to this point. Many of us read numerous books about eagles. And I read one a while back called The Christian Eagle, and it does quite an analytic study on eagles and eaglets. He says, that, this guy says, the first thing about an eagle is that the female picks her husband. Does that sound familiar to anybody else in the room? Sir, you just thought you chose her. You were done before you even knew it. And you've been in training ever since. All men are in training. Did you know that? Some are resistant to it, but all men are in training. And, and here's, here's how, how she does this. He comes around wanting a date, and she looks at him, and she picks up a twig or a stone, and she flies into the air. And the male will take off after her, and when she gets high enough for the first courtship test, she dumps the twig or the branch, and he dives, because an eagle can go 200 miles an hour straight down. He dives down, and he catches the stick, and he takes it and puts it on the ground. And she said, that's pretty good for a start. <laughs> then she picks up a larger log or a heavier rock, and the writer says she's been known to pick up something that weighs as much as she does. She'll ascend up 5,000 feet in the air, and the male is chasing after her. And when she gets ready for the next test, she dumps the log, and he, de he heads down after it to try to catch it before it hits the ground. Now, what is that all about? He says that if they fall in love and they have these little bambinos, mom and dad are both involved in the training of the eaglets. Here's what happens. Mama comes and disturbs the nest. She takes it apart and throws the eaglets over the cliff, and it's daddy's job to catch them before they hit the ground. Friends, we had a daddy that's watching us when we fall off that cliff, when you make steps of faith, when you step out to trust God. Sometimes you feel like you're in a free fall, at the, that you're about to hit the ground, but underneath us are the everlasting arms of the Lord tonight. I'm afraid... There are many pastors and churches that have fallen prey to the nesting syndrome. Because the nest is the place that you build for your security in case God doesn't come through. And I believe the Holy Spirit is saying to us afresh in these days, launch out, go farther. Audacious faith. Have you heard that this week yet? Trust me, the Lord is saying. Trust me like your forefathers trusted me. You want to see the supernatural? You want to see me work in power and glory and majesty? Then let me shake up your nest and teach you how to fly again. 
Not only is the nesting syndrome present, there are many pastors and leaders who have folded their wings. Until the eagle mama comes start disturbing and destroying the nest, they will never tap into their potential. And I hear the Holy Spirit saying to some of us afresh tonight, we are people of promise. God has put incredible potential in our lives. He's going to stir us up. He's going to shake us up so we can open up and catch the wind again. We can't just be another church on the block. We've got to be able to mount up with the wings of eagles. Here's what the Spirit is saying to us. I'm not happy you were just born. You were not born to die in your nest. You were born to fly from your nest. Hallelujah. We have many pastors who folded their wings. You know, those that are in the sunset years of their life, it's very easy to feel like it's time to fold your wings. But I want to say to some of you with gray hair in the room tonight, there's stuff inside you that you need to share with the rest of the body of Christ. There are eaglets out here that need your wisdom, that need your leadership, that need the spiritual dynamic of your life. And the Holy Spirit is saying we cannot afford to sit in our nest and fold our wings because the greatest day of harvest is right in front of us now. Only the young people are clapping. I did a seniors conference in Myrtle Beach three years ago. They won't have me back. Because I, I said to them, you know, you can retire from whatever you, company you work for. You can retire from doing dishes. You can retire from cooking, as the case is at our home. But you cannot retire from the work of God. You see, the calling doesn't change, brothers and sisters. The assignment might, but the calling never changes. Mm -mm. Oh, there's a message right there. I mean, you just keep moving, Ron. We're people of promise. We need some seniors that are mentoring young men. We need some mamas in the faith that are mentoring young ladies. You know, there are a bunch of eaglets out here that need an example on how to move into the heavenlies and how to fly and how to ascend. We've been given a heavenly calling, not an earthly calling, a heavenly calling. We need to, somebody to show us how to catch the wind. We have wings that can lift us above the birds of play, prey. We have wings that can take us into the spirit. But unfortunately, there are many who will not try their wings as long as the nest is comfortable. That's why I believe the Holy Spirit is saying, I've come to shake everything that can be shaken so the things that cannot be shaken will remain. In this book about eagles, the writer says there are two amazing visits that take place. And the first is that mama eagle, she comes and the nest can be between 10 and 10, 10 and, uh, 6 and 10 feet wide. It can weigh up to 2,000 pounds with all the stuff that they bring and she puts in it. Then there comes a day when she comes to the nest and the kids get freaked out because mama looks like a wild person. She's got this crazy look in her eyes and she's not acting right. She starts throwing things out of the nest. The down, the feathers, all the soft stuff. Now, she doesn't dismantle the nest. Now, her first visit is to make them uncomfortable in the nest. Here's why. Because they have two gifts that they know nothing about. They have talons and they have wings. And mama wants to teach them how to use their talons first because they need to learn how to stand. And when she throws the junk out of the nest, they're forced to grab a hold of the sturdy sticks and the lumber. They can't just lay around. Anybody remember that dog you used to have in the back window of your car? Just... We've raised up some folks in the church that want to fly, but they don't know how to stand. We need to learn how to stand. So when you fly, you come back and you love people and you have godly character and you know how to tell the truth and you're honest. We don't need more gymnastics for Jesus. We need people who know how to stand. And the Lord over many years has been teaching us how to stand. And I'm grateful for our fellowship. We are grounded in the word of God. We stand for the truth of God's word. And we are not only to reach the lost, but we're to make disciples. I have a real issue going on right now because we got folks in our church been saved for 30 years, but are still spiritual babies. You know why I know? They get their feelings hurt at the drop of the hat and, and, go, and run home and pout for three weeks. I mean, no, I've been to your church. (laughs) 
You see, we used to think that attendance made you spiritual. If that were the case, three times a week, we'd have had giants in the faith because we gave out pins for perfect attendance. But how many know you can come to church every Sunday and still never grow up in Jesus? It's not the knowledge of the word, it's what you do with that. You know, I even have pastors like that, they'll come to one of my seminars and say, well, you know, I already heard all that stuff Ron's talking about. And you know, my response is, well, God bless you. What are you doing about it? Because if you haven't implemented it in your ministry, you need to hear it again and again and again and again until you get it. Repetition's a wonderful thing, brothers and sisters. Those visits. The Spirit of God is saying to us, I believe you're standing for my name. You've stood for the truth. You've stood for what's right. Now I want to teach you how to fly again. I want to take you beyond the perimeters of your last limitation. If what you did yesterday still looks big to, big to you, you haven't done much today. I'm going to show you what those folded wings are for. And it happens suddenly. All of a sudden, mama comes. She's had a bad hair day. She shows up and she starts throwing sticks everywhere, throwing logs out. She's throwing out everything. And the legalists are running around in the nest saying, Daddy, help us, Daddy, help us, help us, help us. And while mom is doing that, daddy's circling. And the little eagle just saying, mom's lost her mind. <laughs> See, it's easy to get comfortable in your nest. I remember as a pastor, I got pretty comfortable in my nest. And God showed up one day and said, I'm going to just throw you out of that nest. He started challenging me to spread my wings and trust him in a fresh way. To not depend upon the security of what I had, but to trust that he was able to lead me and guide me. And essentially, God threw me out of my nest. And I'm still learning how to fly, but the Lord is faithful. Amen? I know this. When you stay in the nest too long, you find yourself competing with others. When you stay in the nest too long, you start counting members and money instead of lost souls. When you stay in the nest too long, you start finding fault with others in ministry. And when you stay in the nest too long, you become satisfied with the status quo. I always want to say, you know, do something. Even if it's wrong, do something. Don't just sit there forever. Those poor little eaglets, you know, they mama, no mama, she's flipped out. She's lost it. She's freaked out. Something's wrong with her. And then she just throws them over out of the nest. But daddy's there to catch them as they're learning how to fly. You see, when you're thrown out of the nest and you're in a free fall, you start finding talent you didn't know you had. I mean, you're in a free fall 5,000 feet, and all of a sudden, ooh, that slowed it down, didn't it? You, you start discovering things you never knew God had gifted you with. And you'll never know that, my friends. You'll never know that, brother and sister, until you're willing to step out in faith to trust God in a new way, in a fresh way. You see, it's easy to get comfortable in your nest. And I believe the Holy Spirit is saying to us, it's time to stand on the edge of the nest and catch the wind and lift our gaze and our wings. It's not by might. It's not by power. It's by his spirit, saith the Lord. Unfold your wings. I believe the Holy Spirit's ready to lift us to a new place. The eagle is one of the few birds in all the world that doesn't flap. Chickens flap, buzzards flap, but not eagles. Eagles spread their wings and catch the wind. The Bible says the eagle stirreth up her nest and fluttereth over them. What is she doing? She gives them an example of how to do it. What's mama up to? Mama doesn't want them to be like barnyard buzzards going flap, 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 flap. Mother saying, stand on the edge, sense the wind. And when it comes, be responsible. Prepare to respond. I believe that the Holy Spirit, as we heard so powerfully last night, is trying to get his church ready for the last great opportunity of harvest. I believe. Some of us are not ready. If 50 people got saved next Sunday, you know what you're going to do with them? Just saying. I know none of you need this, but you know people who do, so take notes. <laughs> and the Holy Spirit is saying to us, if I can just get some of my people to start catching the wind. 
the circle of their influence is going to get larger and larger and larger. But sometimes the Holy Spirit's got to shake us into our destiny. It's easy to become at ease in Zion, going through the status quo, depending upon our structure and our organization. But I believe the Holy Spirit is throwing things out of our nest and shaking us in these days to say there's something beyond where you are. I've not raised up this movement to become a great organization. I've not raised up this movement to miss the last great day of harvest. I've raised up this movement and I've given you resources. I've given you talents. I've given you gifts. I've given you all that you have, not to sit in your nest, but to respond to the promptings of the Holy Spirit right now. To be everything I've called you to be. To reach your destiny. To reach the potential I've ordained for this fellowship. To reach the potential I've ordained for Hawaii. To reach the potential I've ordained for every church in this room. To reach the potential that I have for every credential holders in this room. Nobody here has reached your destiny yet. You know, I, uh, I was here a lot long, like, well, a lot of many, many years ago with, my, with one of the stalwarts of the faith, one of the, the heroes of, my, of the faith, of Jim Morocco over here. And, you know, I go to churches and I hear pastors whining about having to do two services. I just want to get out my violins, you know. There's a day I used to do five. I went to, went to spend, spend some time with Jim Morocco. I mean, I never worked so hard in all my life. I mean... I mean, I think we started at 5 in the morning. I, uh, Jim, I didn't know God was even awake at 5 o'clock in the morning. We were having church over at Jim's place. And I preached four times, and then he, he says, I got a plane ready for you. you we're going to fly you to another island. I thought I was done. I just got started that day, you know. Because there's a man with passion. God ignite passion in every one of us. Status quo is killing us. Business as usual is killing us. The Lord said, I've raised up this movement to not miss this last day of harvest. It's time to take a chance. It's time for some audacious faith. It's time for us to begin to risk some things for the kingdom of God. It's time for us to trust God in ways we've never trusted him before. And I believe as the Lord has been doing in my own life is dismantling my nest again, not to destroy me, but to develop the potential that is still in me. And I believe God is saying, if you don't get out of your nest, I'm going to dismantle it. I'm going to disrupt it. I'm going to dislodge it because you becoming what I want you to be is more important than your comfort. We were not designed to flap. We were designed to soar. A lot of flapping going on these days in the church. You know what flapping does? It draws attention to yourself. Job 29, Job was crying out in those first three verses. I wish it was like in the days of old. We still have folks in the church like that. I wish things wouldn't change. Well, it's changing whether you want it to or not. The society around us is changing. And the Holy Spirit is challenging us to a new understanding of how to reach a new generation that's different than any generation we've ever reached before. But the one thing that's happened in a lot of Assembly Oh My God churches is that we made the stuff sacred. All I did was move the communion table and somebody got stammering lips. I just moved the communion table for God's sake, you know. Because we made stuff sacred. I said we made stuff sacred. You know, when I went to Winston-Salem, uh, took that church, 31 years of age, and uh, I was there like six weeks when I learned something about change. I moved the piano from one side of the platform to the other without getting permission. And when Leonard and Henry showed up on Sunday, they went ballistic. I thought I was the pastor. I could move the piano. I learned that day that change is not a moment, it's a process. You don't move a piano in one Sunday, you move it one inch a Sunday. <laughs> yeah, when I got there, uh, grass is growing up around the building, and I called one of the deacons. I said, somebody needs to get down here and cut the grass. He said, our former pastor always cut the grass. I said, well, I've called him. He don't want to do it anymore. It's a good way to start. <laughs> if I knew 
that we paid money for this. This is H2O in plastic. I had no idea we'd actually pay money for this. And this is the cheap stuff here. Uh, I mean, you can, pay, you can pay big bucks for Fiji water. Maybe some from Maui too, I don't know, you know. Uh, but it's still H2O. I had no idea you'd actually pay money for this. I could be a billionaire today. The message doesn't change. I said, the message doesn't change. It's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Nobody, nobody that I know of, including our superintendent, Ron McManus, and, and John, and all the rest of us, we will tell you that the truth of God is what sets people free. We're not going to compromise it. We're not going to water it down. But the package we put it in has to keep changing. I got a, I got a little grandson. His name is Cole. He's four going on 14. When he was two years of age, he could open up my iPhone, flick it to the app he wanted with his little thumb, and make a snowball. Two years of age. When I was two years old, I was still trying to find my pacifier. <laughs> and by the way, time out was the length of time you were unconscious in my world, but that's another story. <laughs> Some of you are going to get that by tomorrow morning. I just know you are. It's still H2O. 20 years ago, we didn't have plastic to put it in. It was in black glass. I don't know what we're going to put it in 10 years from now, but I can tell you this, it still be H2O. You see, the message that won't change, it can't change. My son said to me uh, back a couple of years ago, and he said, Dad, if you think a guy who comes into, into church that looks like he just fell out of a tap, tackle box, and it's tatted from head to toe. If you think he's going to be freaked out by a message in tongues, you don't get this. He's going to be excited about that. Because he's hungry for something real. I said he's hungry for something real. And so, we, you know, Cole is not going to sit in somebody's Sunday school class and watch a flannel board presentation for 30 minutes. So go ahead and toss those when you get home, please. We've got to use the best technology we can to communicate an eternal message of the Word of God to the next generation. You see, society's changing every two to three years. The church has been changing every 30 to 40 years. And it's not about the message. It's about the hardening of the categories. Because when we take the way we do it and make it sacred, we knit it to the Word of God that... Everything is sacred. Let me just say, to the, to say this to everybody at your church, please. The only thing sacred in this house is the word of God. Everything else is up for discussion. We've got to get pliable. We've got to get flexible. Job said, I wish it was like in times past when things were nifty and people obeyed my counsel and my kids were all around me and the candle of the Lord shined in my tent. Is really kind of neat, Job said. Then Job made the dumbest mistake by saying out loud, well, I got my flocks and my sheep and my gold and my silver and my kids and my stuff. I've got a nice nest here. I think I'll just die in my nest. And God said, what? Do you think I blessed you so you can die in your nest? I'd never blessed you, Job, so you could die there. In fact, what I'm going to do right now, I'm going to mess up your nest. Not to destroy you, but give you a new encounter with me so you'll lift yourself to a higher place. And instead of just believing in me, Job, you're going to see me face to face. Job was a great man. He had it all together. Thousands of people in the human race have been blessed, inspired, encouraged because what God did with Job's life, what he went through and the declarations he made and the things which are written about him and the experiences that he had strengthened millions and millions of people. Just think about it. If God could bust up your, your, your nest this morning, this, tonight, who could you touch? Who could you affect? Who could be moved by your Christian demeanor? Though he slay me, yet will I trust him. Though I lose everything, I'll not lose my faith in God. God was trying to get Job out of his nest to go higher. And the writer of Hebrews says that God is going to shake everything that can be shaken so that the things that cannot be shaken will remain. 
when we got in the middle of COVID, I, I pastored a church through COVID, 18 months through COVID. I know a little bit about that. And I said to pastors all over this country, in every vehicle I had to communicate, you need to ask yourself three questions coming out of COVID. What should I stop doing? What should I start doing? And what should I keep doing? And many of us missed the best opportunity we had to make the changes we needed to make at our church. In the face of all of that, we're seeing the backlash of what happened to COVID. Pastors that are just burnt out and worn out. I understand that. But in the face of, of all of that, the Lord is saying, I want to kindle a fresh fire in my church, in my people. I can't, I, I can't tell you tonight how the passion and fire burns in my spirit. I'm, I'm older than almost, almost every, Jim Morocco and I are probably the oldest people in the room, I guess. I mean, I'm probably older than him. I'll tell you what, I just got started. I, got, I just got started. I'll, I'll take the red eye Thursday night back to the East Coast and I'll be speaking Saturday and Sunday somewhere else. You know, my kids, my boys who, who in ministry, if they, they took this trip, with me, they'd have to rest four days before they could do anything else. <laughs> and all my friends and family say, you're going to burn out, you're going to burn out, you're going to burn out. No, I'm not. No, I'm not. No, I'm not. I'm going faster than I did 20 years ago. I'm not going to burn out. I'm going to get tired. My body's going to get weary, but I'm going to tell you the fuel for my fire is not my flesh. It's the Holy Spirit. I said it's the Holy Spirit. How many know there's a limited supply of him? Hallelujah. Come on, somebody get this tonight. I know leadership. I've taught leadership. I've read books on leadership. I work with John who wrote more, more books than you can even imagine. But I can tell you this. With everything I know, I'm more dependent on the Lord tonight than I've ever been in my life. I'm more dependent on him than I've ever been in my life. I have two sons. I was told, you raise these kids. Feed them, clothe them. Try to help them get through college. And one day, they're going to be on their own. I'm still waiting. <laughs> and then the grandkids showed up and I had a financial reversal. <laughs> I have a dream. Now, don't come up to me after the meeting and mess with my dream. I have a dream that one night... Me and my sons and their spouses and their kids are all going to go out with, to dinner with me. And at the end of the meal, one of my sons will say, Dad, I'll pick up the tab tonight. <laughs> it's still a dream. It's amazing how my boys got to go to the bathroom by the time that check shows up at the table. You see, the deal was that we were to raise kids and get them on their own where they're independent of us. But what the Lord is trying to do tonight is bring us back here to childlike dependence on him. Unless he builds the house, we labor in vain that build it. How many know God doesn't owe us anything? We owe him everything tonight. We owe him everything tonight. When you have a great sense of safety and security, it can rob you of praise and rejoicing. The only time we praise is when we have a spirit of humility. And God is searching tonight. He's looking for those who will worship him in spirit and in truth. He wants to find somebody that wants to be better than the way they are. And you can't be better than the way you are if you stay safe in your nest. You notice some people back in our churches, they always sit in the same seat. You know why? Because nothing happens there. 
I'm not sitting next to those new converts. They may knock my wig off or something. We may need to put placards up. Danger, there are folks with wings in this section over here. You've got to become vulnerable if you're ever going to be an effective worshiper. See, that's the problem with the security nest. You're never vulnerable. So God strips away the nest and says, now you're vulnerable, which means now you need me. See, problems allow us to praise someone greater than us. If I don't have any problems, I'll begin to praise myself. Ain't that right, Nebuchadnezzar? Is this not the great Babylon that I built by my wisdom, my power, and my coolness? And a voice from heaven said, what? You said what? You built this by yourself? One night, God stepped down to destroy Nebuchadnezzar's nest, not to destroy him, but to give him a greater vision of who God was. If God can do that for the heathen, what will he do for those who name his name? And I think it was goodness. Tomorrow night, I'll tell you a little bit about my story. I'm not supposed to be here. I'm supposed to be dead 24 years ago. Two tumors in my chest the size of grapefruits, lymphoma. And there are people say, my gosh, I'm, I'm just... Wish he hadn't made it, you know. I mean, we listen at him. When I think of where he's brought me from, I want to praise him. And I want to say to every pastor, spouse, and ministry leader in this house tonight, you, you look pretty good. You clean up well. But here's what I know. If it weren't for God's grace, some of you wouldn't be here tonight. If, if it weren't for God's mercy. You wouldn't have a church, you wouldn't have a home, you wouldn't have a family, you wouldn't have anything. And if God never does another thing for you for the rest of your life, he is worthy of praise and honor and rejoicing from your lips for the rest of your life. Come on. We still got preachers with their arms folded. Come on, somebody. You're about to miss a good service here tonight. God wants to take us to a plateau we've never been on before. God wants to take stuff out of our nest so we can fly higher to become something we've never been before. They that hunger and thirst shall be full. If I heard anything from, from, from an incredible speaker last night and from our superintendent today, it's that the Lord wants to release us from all the things that hold us back. What's holding you back tonight? What's keeping you from going all the way? God wants to take everybody in this room to a plateau we've never been before. God wants to take the stuff out of our nest so we can go higher. So we become something we've never been before. You know, here's, here's the thing that concerns me about Ron. When I stand before him one day, and he says, Ron, there's so much more I'd like to have done with you if you'd only let me. I don't want that to happen. How about you? Lord, I want to free you to do everything you want to do in my life, in my ministry. One day God busted up David's nest. He became discouraged and he said something like this. One day I'm going to perish at the hand of Saul. Friend, Saul could not have killed David if he had an atomic bomb. So what does David do? He says, well, being as I can't find God, I'll become my own savior. I'm going, to, I'm going to take my little nest down to Ziglag and build me a little condo down there because I can't trust God to protect me. He did anoint me and tell me I was going to be the next king, but you know how God is. He has Alzheimer's. He can't remember where I'm at. And God watches this little kid, David, go down to Ziglag with his nest and David thinks to himself, well, I'm safe here. And while he's out on one of his lion hunts, God torches his nest. Here's what's significant, brothers and sisters. The 18 months David was in Ziglag, he never wrote a psalm. Because when you fall in love with the nest, your music stops. I came here tonight to irritate somebody. <laughs> the music stops. It's easy to, to make all the excuses in the world why, why we're not seeing victory. But I just, I just sense in my own heart tonight that, that God wants to, before you leave here this week, 
help you to see what he's planned for you. To see what he's ordained for you. My sister last night, she just, she just irritated me with, with the power of that word of, of what God had said to Abraham. I don't think many of us realize we've been blessed. God's called us to that, to be instruments in that. In the Swiss Alps, many, many people take the journey to some of those mountain peaks because from some of the mountain peaks in the Swiss Alps, you can see several countries. Such an incredible view. I tell you that there's some incredible views in, in this country that in Hawaii like, like I've never seen before. But over there in Europe, they think the Swiss Alps are the big deal. And people take that journey to the top of those mountain peaks to see three, four, five countries from the top of those mountains. And usually there'll be a, a group of folks that go about a hundred in the caravan. And about halfway up that mountain, there's a, a place for them to get refreshments and to get prepared for the rest of the journey. You know, there's a roaring fireplace and there's coffee and chocolate and cookies and all kind of great things. And so when 100 people are going up to that mountain peak, they'll stop there at that halfway place and, and get refreshed and get renewed. And if there's 100 on the trip, when they get ready to go on further, about 25 out of the 100 will say, you know what, my... My legs are aching. My feet are hurting. I just think I'll wait here. The rest of you all go on. And so about 75 people continue on the trek to the top of the mountain. And those that are left behind are watching, and they have binoculars, they, the glass windows they can see as the group is continuing up the side of that mountain. And after a few hours, somebody's reporting to the group left at the halfway place. Well, they're almost there. They're almost there. And there's still excitement in the room. And then somebody shouts out, they made it! They made it to the top. They're seeing things they've never seen before. And through the binoculars, somebody's saying, they're doing high fives on top of that mountain. They are happy, they are excited, and they're pointing stuff out that they've never seen before. But all of a sudden, the atmosphere changes at the halfway house. Regret starts to set in for those that didn't go. And it can become somber. The excitement and the joy is gone. Because now it begins to settle in. I missed it. And when the group gets back to the halfway place from the top of the mountain, nobody has to tell you who went and who didn't. Because those who went have stories to tell. I said, those who went have excitement. They're talking about, did you see this? Did you remember? But 25 of them have nothing to say. They have nothing to tell. As I was praying this afternoon, I felt the Holy Spirit say to me, Ron, somehow, somehow, Get every pastor and every leader in this room to make a decision tonight. I'm not going to stop halfway. I said, I'm not going to stop halfway. I'm going all the way. I'm going all the way. Come on, somebody. Somebody stand with me all over this room. I'm asking you to spread your wings tonight. There's a fresh wind of the Spirit. If I get my musicians here, please. There's a fresh wind of the Spirit 
blowing in the house tonight? Does anybody here want to catch the wind tonight? Anybody here sick and tired of being sick and tired? Anybody here tired of business as usual? Anybody here ready to say, Lord, I'm not going to stop halfway. I'm going every, all the way. I'm going to all you've got planned, all you've designed for my church, all you've designed for my ministry, Lord. I'm going all the way. I'm going all the way. I'm going all the way. Come on, lift, lift, lift your wings right now and just let's begin to say, Lord, just, just let us catch a fresh wind tonight. Come on. Let us catch a fresh wind tonight, Lord. Fresh wind of your spirit tonight, Lord. Hallelujah. Just begin to worship him. Lift your voice. You're grateful for what he's already done. Just begin to praise him. Begin to glorify his name tonight. Hallelujah. 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 Yes, Lord, we thank you. We receive it now in Jesus' name. We receive it now in Jesus' name. Receive it now in Jesus' name. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Holy Spirit of God, Holy Spirit of God. As there's a wind, there's a wind blowing tonight. Would you catch the wind tonight? Would you catch the wind tonight? Would you catch the wind tonight? Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. In the name of Jesus, 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 in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. I've just, I've just got to be obedient to what I feel like the Holy Spirit's saying to me. What's holding you back? Is it something that happened at your church? You know, I got my feelings hurt the first Sunday I was pastor. And people say, well, I got my feelings hurt. I said, we'll just get in line. But what can hold us back? What can hold us back are things we've, we've let get in our spirits, that we've let harbored in our hearts. And I, I didn't plan to do what I'm going to do right now, but I just know God's told me to do this. Because... The Lord doesn't want anything holding you back from going all the way to the top of that mountain. In the book of Luke, Jesus was teaching one Sunday. And there's a, a guy who slipped in the back of the service. He slipped down on the back row. And while Jesus is teaching, he stopped like John, God uses John to do. Jesus stopped and said, sir, you back there, stretch forth your hand. Well, his hand had been hurt. He was a stonemason, and his hand had been crushed, and there was a bandage on it. Sir, stretch forth your hand. You know, apparently this teacher doesn't know what happened to me. Apparently this teacher doesn't realize I've been hurt. That's why, I mean, he wouldn't say that if he knew I'd been hurt. And when Jesus said, stretch forth your hand to the guy in the back row, you see, if you're in the back row, you can't turn around and see if he's talking to somebody else. It's you. You see, everybody in town knew he had been hurt. Because when, you, when you've been hurt, you want to tell everybody. It's been on Facebook, you've been hurt. It's been on Twitter, I've been hurt. Did I mention I've been hurt? Do, do you all realize I've been hurt? I mean, how can I, how can I function? I've been hurt. And that's kind of what happens to us in ministry if we're not careful. What's holding you back tonight? And Jesus says to him, stretch forth your hand, sir. Now we know that his hand had withered now because that's what atrophy sets in. Anything you don't use, you lose. So if you stop walking long enough, your legs will stop working. And so the hurt that happened to his hand now is affecting his whole arm. And he has a withered hand, the Bible says.
I don't know what, what caused your hand to be withered. I don't know what hurt you. But he does. And he stopped what I'm doing tonight because he loves you too much to leave you alone. And he wants you to leave this room whole. W-H-O-L-E. Whole. Stretch forth your hand, sir. Well, I can't do that. Did I mention I've been hurt? You see, here's what he doesn't understand. It's not a pastor telling him to stretch forth his hand. It's not a doctor telling him to stretch forth his hand. It's not just a bystander or a teacher telling him, stretch forth his hand. The person who's saying, stretch forth your hand, is the son of the living God. The person who's saying, stretch forth your hand, is the God of very God. The person who's saying, stretch forth your hand, is the one who created everything that is. The one who says, stretch forth your hand, is the healer. The one who says, stretch forth your hand, is all that you have need of. He is the one tonight that says, stretch forth your hand and be healed in Jesus' name. Somebody, God has stopped this meeting right now for at least one, and there's probably others, and you just need to stretch forth your hand right now and say, Jesus, I receive your healing right now. I receive your healing right now. I receive your healing right now. Go ahead and, go ahead and say it. Lord, I receive it now. Nothing's going to hold me back. Nothing's going to hold me back from what you've planned, from what your purposes are, what your designs are for me. Hallelujah. Nothing's going to hold me back. Hallelujah. He that the sun sets free is free indeed. Hallelujah. Come on, somebody give him praise. Somebody worship him tonight. Hallelujah. 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 Catch the wind tonight. Catch the wind tonight. Catch the wind tonight. Hallelujah. 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 Don't leave here like you came tonight. Hallelujah. 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 There's some in this room that... As we, uh, Pastor talked last night in the powerful message last night and the altar service last night, there's still others that tonight just need to say to God, Lord, I, I've settled for halfway. I've settled for status quo because I let people decide your vision. I let people decide how far we go. And the other thing I'm praying for is that we will no longer, after this night meeting, allow three or four or five people to sabotage the future of your church. Come on. Come on. Is there anybody here willing to say, I'm all in, God? I'm all in. I'm all in. I'm not going to ask you to come to the front because this, this all calls for everybody in the room. So I want you just to lift your hands to the Lord and just say, Lord, let me just catch the wind tonight. Let me catch the wind tonight. Let me live in freedom and victory and power and provision tonight. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Oh, let's lift our voice, church. Come on. Receive it now. To do whatever you want to. To do whatever you want to. And I will make room for you. Oh, come on, sing it. Sing it.
want to, Lord. You want to. Do whatever you want to, Lord. Do whatever you want to. Paul said, the Lord is saying, I'm going to shake everything that can be shaken. He's shaking the political system of this nation. He's shaking the government of this nation. He's shaking world leaders. Everything that can be shaken will be shaken so that the things that cannot be shaken will remain. Does anybody here know what can't be shaken? It's his kingdom, amen? It's his kingdom. Hallelujah. We're preachers of his kingdom. We belong to another kingdom where there's peace in the midst of sorrow, where there's joy in the midst of trouble. The Lord says, I'm, I'm shaking you from your comfort zone. Because you becoming what I want you to be is more important than your comfort. That ain't easy to say. But that's what the Lord's doing in Ron right now. All the things I depend on, Lord, said, you know what? Let's just, let's just get rid of that and let's see if you still trust me. Let's see if you still know I'm your source. So if, if you're, going, you're going through stuff, just understand it, God's working in the midst of it the willing to do of his good pleasure hold fast I said hold fast hallelujah hold on to what's eternal hallelujah hallelujah oh somebody's getting victory in the house tonight somebody's getting victory hallelujah 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 can I just say one other thing this is the exciting thing about being a part of this great district oh I just one of the greatest ones in in the assemblies of God. And I don't say that everywhere, I promise you. Wouldn't it be wonderful if we just made a decision tonight that we're committed to each other's success? Nobody here is competing with anybody else here. I said nobody's competing with anybody else here. We're in this together. You know, you know, I've been, I've been raised in this, so I, I got all the stuff. You know, you know we, we used to say, you know, we don't want somebody building a church nearby because those, those are my centers. I'm not going to be able to reach them, but you better not try to reach them. There ain't but one church in Hawaii. We're in this together. And when your brother across the island succeeds, then we'll find out how good you can rejoice in that because that tells you something about who you are tells you something about your motives I just believe God wants to join our hearts and hands together to say you know we're we're in this together and we're going to see God shake these islands transform these islands by the power of the Holy Spirit in Topeka Kansas about 15 to 18 students got together one day and said what is this about this Holy Spirit thing We, we got to find out what this is all about. And then they begin to pray. And that little old Bible college in Topeka, Kansas, the Lord has promised they that hunger and thirst are going to be filled. And revival broke up in Topeka, broke out among a little, little Bible college with a bunch of students who had a hunger for God. Before you knew it, it was over in Azusa Street. And the revival spread because of hungry, hungry, hungry people. I'm not satisfied, you know. You thought this sermon was bad tonight, you ought to heard it if God hadn't helped me. How many are grateful God's helping you? He wants all of it. I said he wants all of it. I, would you just join me right now and, and say, Lord, bless my brothers and sisters all across this house. Bless their ministries. Bless what their hand touches. Bless everything that they do for you, Lord. Just bless them. Bless them. Prosper them, Lord. Give them a harvest, Lord. Hallelujah. We remove all discouragement in the name of Jesus.
and we receive your provision. We receive it in Jesus' name. We receive it in Jesus' name. We receive it in Jesus' name. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Would you just spread your wings one more time and just say, Lord, we're candidates. We're candidates for everything that happened in Topeka and in Azusa Street and everywhere else. We want it all, Lord. We want it all. We're not holding back. We want all of it, Lord. Come on, come on. Lord, just, just pour out of your presence of power even right now in this room, Lord. Hallelujah. Just begin to pray, worship him in, in the language of the Spirit right now. Lord, we just praise you now. We praise you now, Lord. Hallelujah. 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 Hallelujah.
who you are. And we are not going to stop halfway. Your people tonight are going to go all the way. We're going to soar like wings with eagles. We will run and not be weary. We will walk and not faint. Because what's inside of us is unshakable. Hallelujah, God. We give you all the praise, the glory, and the honor for all these things in Jesus' name. And all God's people tonight say amen, amen. Can you give the Lord a clap offering? I just want to encourage you tonight. God has spoken to us a word. And what are we going to do with that word? Are we just going to go home, we're going to forget it, or are we going to do something about it? And I want to challenge you. When you leave these, these doors, when you go home or you go to the hotel or wherever you're going, I want to challenge you. Do something with the word God is giving you. I think a lot of you already know what you've got to do. Now you got to go and do it. I think the second thing is, if you have, are we streaming this on Facebook, YouTube? I think we are. So what I want you to do, if God is really, if you can think of someone who needs to hear this word, share it with your friends. Share it with your friends because the world needs to know that Jesus is alive up from the ashes. Hope is arising tonight in our hearts and we're not going to stop halfway. So before we leave tonight, I just want to let you know that uh, Dr. Ron McManus, he has this book called The Transition Leader, and he only has a few copies left. So if you want to buy it, get to the back. It's at the Connection Center, as well as uh, John, Prophet John Harkey. He's selling the many, many books. One of them is called Leading with Generosity. And what you've received tonight, you can take it home with you. So I just want to encourage you, go to the back. Uh, you can get those books. And tomorrow, we will have breakfast, guys. We will have breakfast at 7.30. So it's going to be at 7.30. And uh, we'll see you tomorrow. God bless you. Have a great evening. Up from the ashes, hopes are rising. God bless you. And I'm going to sing in the middle of the storm.